Doherty. Please be seated. This is the time set for oral argument in Marin B. and Zaniel G. v. The Honorable Padilla et al. Our special action number 19-0294. We have read the petition, the memoranda submitted in support and in opposition to that petition, the various appendices and supplemental appendices that have been submitted, and as much as the record as we were provided in that regard. So we're familiar with the issues, which we believe are as follows. And I would ask the counsel to confine their argument to the extent possible to them. First of all, the exclusion of the foster parents from the court on December 13th. Secondly, the removal of the child from the foster placement on the same day. We're not here to decide the merits of the motion to intervene. That is not right because it has not been ruled on. The court did not, the law did not rule on that. We are also familiar with the allegations and information concerning father's criminal history, and we don't need to have repeated references to that this morning, unless it is entirely relevant to a particular point that's being made. So with that regard, in that regard, each side will have 20 minutes within which to present their argument. Today, petitioner may reserve some portion of that for rebuttal. However, Mr. Horn, it's up to you to keep track of your time in that regard. With that, we may proceed. Mr. Chief Judge, and may it please the court, we're asking that the child be immediately returned, and that is in conformity with the court's request that we address the fact that the parents were removed from the court and the child was removed without any notice and without any procedure. What the trial court did was a blatant violation of ARS section 8-515.05, which provides a specific procedure involving the foster parents in the deliberations and giving them a chance to be heard. The reason given for removal was not even a rational reason and certainly was not an emergency. The removal was allegedly because the foster parents threatened publicity, and the second reason given in the oral argument that we had on the stay that they had advocated against family unification. Removing the child punishes the child but does not decrease the risk of publicity. If the parents had threatened publicity, which they did not do, they would be as likely to do it after removal as before removal. So removal does not address that. The sanctions for publicity are that it's a misdemeanor, you can be prosecuted, or you can be held in contempt of court. But removing the child punishes the child, does not do anything to decrease the motive to violate the court order for publicity if that were going to happen. So, Mr. Hart, you're asking us to direct the lower court to order DCS to comply with the procedure outlined in 8-515.05? That's correct, Your Honor. But you're also asking that the child be returned to your client's custody pending that process? Yes, Your Honor, because the child was removed illegally in a secret ex parte proceeding that blatantly violated the statute. The child should be with the only caregivers the child has known for the child's entire life, the 13 months of the child's life. Up until the last several weeks? Yes, until the last several weeks. But the department should not be able to do something illegal and then say, well, let's leave the child with this other family now. The child is suffering every day that the child is separated from the only caregivers the child has ever known for the 13 months of the child's life. 
All right, Mr. Horn, let, let me ask you a couple of questions. So first, we have the issue of removal of the foster parents from the hearing on December 13th. What should have been the process used by the court? The process used should have been the process set forth in 515.05. I'm talking about removal of the foster parents from the courtroom based on information that they had been disclosing, confidential information. This is before the alleged comments were made and the child is removed. The parents, the caregivers should not have been removed from the court at all. The foster parents should have had a right to refute what was said by the clerk. But I'm talking before that. So before the foster parents are outside of the courtroom and allegedly make a statement that is then relayed to the judge, there's a discussion had, there's a request made that they be excused from the courtroom, not that the courtroom be completely closed off to non-parties or closed to the public, but that the foster parents specifically not be allowed to remain. What should have happened then? The court should have said no. There's no provision in statute or rule that provides for kicking the foster parents out of the courtroom. The court should have said no. They have a right to participate. That's in the statute. Doesn't 8-525 control open court proceedings in this setting and give the court discretion to close the hearing if doing so is in the child's best interests or even to protect the privacy rights of not only the child but the parents and guardians as well? Yes, but there's no such consideration here, Your Honor. The foster parents had not done anything wrong. So I guess I think Judge Cruz was perhaps asking, if I could restate it, is how should the court have handled that? The court should have said no. We're not going to exclude the foster parents. They have a right to participate. If you want to do something, tell me what it is you want to do, have them hear it, and let them give their point. That's the whole point of an adversary system that we have in this country. In a totalitarian system, it's different. Things are done in secret, and people find out what was done in secret. But in our American system, you want to hear from both sides so the judge can make a good decision based on hearing from all the different points of view. Had the counsel for the parents or DCS, or not DCS, had the counsel for the parents in their motion for change of custody asked that the foster parents be excluded from any court proceedings? They can ask, but it's not legal for the judge to. I'm simply asking if there was notice to your clients that that request was going to be made or had been made. I don't remember if there was notice to my client, Your Honor, but I think it's a completely illegal request. I don't object to somebody making a legal request. I would count on the trial judge to do what's right, and the right thing to do was to have them there to give their point of view, not to exclude them and do something in secret like that. Do you think the court has the authority to exclude only some persons from an otherwise open proceeding? The court has authority if there's a good reason, but there was no reason to do that in this case, so that's an abuse of the court's authority. Now, the parents did not threaten publicity. All right, let me interject for just a moment because I do have another part that I wanted to explore with you, Mr. Horn. So we agree that the court can remove a person from proceedings under certain circumstances, right? I mean, your position is not that under no circumstances may the court exclude the foster parents from the courtroom. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, and your position is that whatever circumstances allow it, we're not attending in this particular instance. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. Now, the other question deals with what happened after removal of the child from the foster parent home. Now, we agree that the procedure in 8515.05 is a procedure to be followed for removal of a child from the foster parent home, correct? Correct, Your Honor. All right, and so there, the foster parents, if they disagreed with DCS's intent to remove, 
barring an emergency, which is the position that they've taken, um, they must give notice to foster parents, foster parents can object, and then there's a, a meeting that is held, correct? Yes. And, uh, and they weigh in, and, and finally the recommendation is given to the court. Um, where is the authority for us to order that the child be returned to foster parents? That's not in 515.05. Well, the child was removed illegally. If the, if, the, if, the, if the process had been followed, then you'd have to look for authority for you to order the child returned. But if they illegally removed the child, then that has to be undone. Well, if, Part D of that statute tells us that if, as a result of the conference, which was not held, I understand that, right. um, the department continues to intend to remove the child uh, and the foster parents continue to disagree, uh, then there are two things that can be done. The first part contemplates uh, the child still being uh, with the foster parents, placed with foster parents, but the second uh, is an alternative for when the child is no longer with the foster parents. And, and that portion says that um, if that's the case, the licensed foster parent shall be advised of the department's conflict resolution process. The department shall expedite the conflict resolution process the child shall remain in the current placement pending the outcome of the conflict resolution process. It doesn't say we that if there's any uh, piece missed that we restore everyone to, to prior status quo. We keep the child where she is uh, until this administrative process is finalized, no? Yes, but that's true. In order to reach that point, you have to have a majority vote of the people who are participating in the conference that the child should be removed from the foster parents. And that includes the foster parents, it includes people from the foster review board, and so on. And there must be a majority vote. In the absence of that majority vote, uh, paragraph D never comes into play. So, so that's completely inapplicable here. Here we have a secret, ex parte, illegal proceeding, um, snatching the child away without any notice, not in the interests of the child, because what they were concerned about was publicity, and that doesn't help them with publicity or with advocacy, which you know, under our system, we encourage advocacy, so the judge has all different points of view. So, the, the, so there was no emergency. It was a completely illegal proceeding. Th this court should not tolerate the idea that no matter how illegal the proceeding is, we're going to live with the consequence of it rather than undo it and, and return the child to the foster parents. Then if somebody wants to make a case that the child should be removed in the child's interests, which the other parties have shown absolutely no concern for the child's interests. None at all. In the, in, the, in the oral argument we had before, there wasn't one word pertaining to the interest of the child. We heard interests of the father, but nothing about the interest of the child. If somebody has a case to say it's in the interest of the child to be taken from the, far, from the foster parents, let them go through the 515.05 the, the procedure. But to, but to sanction this kind of illegal secret ex parte procedure at snatching away the child without any, without any interest of the child involved and without any proper procedure, without any notice even, um, would be to sanction improper conduct. But if we do that, let's say we say go back and we follow this procedure and the outcome is the child is removed, haven't we just compounded the problem by bouncing the child back and forth? Doesn't it make more sense at this point and not necessarily inconsistent with the statute to say child stays where the child is, let's go through the process. Um, Your Honor, the child was with the foster parents for 13 months. It was the only caregivers the child knew. I have submitted to the court an article of, about all the different scientific studies that show this adverse psychological impact that child is experiencing every day. The child is separated from the only caregivers the child knew for 13 months. It would be a gift to the child, an important gift, having to do with its psychology for the rest of the child's life to return the child to the caregivers, to the child's relief. Isn't to that what you should be arguing during that administrative process, though? And, and with the foster care review people there, everybody going from that, not to this court, to decide what's in the child's best interest based on a record that we really don't have, the complete information. Your Honor, um, one of Parkinson's laws is that delay is the deadliest form of denial. The longer the child is separated from the caregivers, the longer the child suffers, the more that would perhaps be a valid argument if we have to go through all the processes in the trial court 
And then the trial court says, well, the child has been this greater length of time with these other foster parents. That rewards illegal conduct. If this conduct is as illegal as I believe it is, it needs to be corrected now. And then if they want to remove the child, let them go through the process. But they don't have any basis to remove this child. There's not one single consideration pertaining to the interest of the child. If the parents, the parents have told this court under oath they're not going to go for publicity. If they did, they could be prosecuted, they could be held in contempt, but don't punish the child. What they said at the time, we're not talking about what they're saying now. At the time, the DCS's concern, as I understand it, was that they were going to go to the media and might expose the child to the adverse publicity. And that's the harm that's being alleged. Now, I understand you're saying that won't happen now, but we're looking at when the trial judge made that decision. Yes, Your Honor. Even, first of all, the foster parents weren't given a chance to give their side of what it was that they allegedly said. But even if we take what the clerk said, the clerk says that the foster parents said he's worried about information getting to the media and it's decisions like this that get information to the media. In other words, you're saying if the judge acted properly, the media wouldn't be interested. There is no threat there. There isn't one. Well, but the part just before that, in that same email you're reading is, quote, I am legally bound to disobey an unlawful order, close quote. So you're telling me that a Superior Court judge is not going to be concerned if, in fact, it's true what the staff member is relaying, that the foster parents are threatening to disobey an order of the court. If that threat is happening, you can see how the court would be concerned. I mean, we don't know exactly which order and how they intend to disobey. Well, we don't know they intended to disobey. We do know, assuming the statement was true and they weren't given a chance to give their side of the story, it would be incumbent on the judge to inquire, to call them, put them under oath, ask them what their intention was, ask them if they understand that they have to obey the court order. This judge, ironic. Right, but the reason I bring that up is because I don't think it'd be fair to say that there was no reason on this earth why the court should have taken that position. You can read that statement, I'm legally bound to disobey an unlawful order, in a million ways. It could be, I'm going to nudge the media to come in and listen, or I'm going to take the child and go to Mexico, or a number of things. And that's why, I agree with you, a hearing should have been held. But to say that there was nothing that should have prompted a reaction, it's probably not a fair presentation. There was nothing to prompt an ex-party secret proceeding snatching the child away without even giving the foster parents a chance to talk. Ironically, the judge himself understood the foster parent was a sergeant in the Army, and that's what they teach them in the Army. The judge himself said it looks like this kind of, had been in the military, and said, in the transcript, said it looks like a typical military statement. She didn't indicate she was about to disobey a court order, and if he had inquired, he would have known that she didn't do that. I'd like to save some time for a rebuttal, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. May it please the Court, my name is Dawn Williams, and I represent the Department of Child Safety, also present is Sarah Michael, counsel for the mother. Your Honors, let me address the easy issue first, and that's the issue of the foster parent's exclusion from the courtroom. Under state law, foster parents have a right to participate in one type of hearing only, and that's a dependency review hearing. Unless and until they're granted permission to intervene, under ARS 8847B2 and Rules of Procedure 37, 56, and 58, Rule of Procedure 37 defines parties and participants. Rules 56 and 58 provide that foster parents are entitled to notice of a dependency review hearing and their right to participate in that hearing. And the same is true of ARS 847B2. They have a right to notice and participation in dependency review hearings. As a matter of courtesy, because foster parents do typically have a great deal of information about the children in their care, they are often welcomed at every hearing in a dependency proceeding. But the fact of the matter is, this was a hearing under Rule 59 to return the child to mother's physical custody. Well, Counsel, what about Rule 41IB in the Juvenile Court Rules, which seems to provide 
the foster parents, among others, be afforded the right to be heard in any proceeding to be held with respect to a child in foster care? It's my belief that the more specific statutes and rules control, and they are very specific in terms of which proceedings foster parents have been granted the right to participate in. Well, if that's the case, why did you, not you, perhaps you, it wasn't you personally, why did DCS object to the motion to exclude foster parents from the courtroom? At that time, the department's position and that of the child's guardian ad litem was that allowing them to simply sit in the courtroom was not going to harm anyone, that they were not, the department at that point didn't share the parents' concerns about the foster parents' release of information. I would point out that this didn't occur in a vacuum. This, the court had been dealing with the foster parents and their release of information since February of that year, and repeatedly, and had been asked repeatedly to admonish the foster parents at every hearing. And so... Well, four days before this hearing, your office filed a pleading which advised the court, number one, you were, that the department was objecting to the allegations made by Mother's Council, and that these were not brand new issues, they were old issues that had been, in the department's view, adequately addressed, and that you would receive appropriate reassurances on a going forward basis. But what happened in between December 9th and December 13th? That it was the foster parents' statements made to court staff after they left the hearing that caused the department to reassess. And even then, I would point out that the department did not request this removal. The removal was made based on an oral motion by the parents' attorneys. Mother and father's attorneys both asked the court, when the court advised the parties of this statement, to remove the child. The department took, during a recess, to go discuss, counsel discussed with upper level management at the department to determine the department's position. And ultimately, because the court had already indicated an intent to order the removal, the department acceded to that anticipated order. So this was not a situation where the department was demanding the removal of this child. The department's concern is that we were in the middle of a Rule 59 hearing. It was very likely that this child was going to be ordered returned to the mother's physical custody at some point in the near future. So counsel, what was the, what caused the department to do the removal without following the 515-05 procedure? The department had no time. The court had already ordered the removal at that point. So in order to comply with... No, the court said that it would grant a CPC. The court orally granted the order, but asked the department to file a written motion and indicated that it would sign that order. Right. So that's not the same as granting. That is saying, what if the department hadn't filed it? Then in that case, the order would never have followed the CPC would not have occurred. I believe that if the department had not filed that motion as requested by the court, the court would have found the department in contempt. Okay. But what still prevented the department from following the 505-1505-C process? Notifying, allowing them to have the hearing or the review that's required by B and actually go through that. Why didn't the department do that? The department believed it was complying with the court order. And the process... Did the court say don't follow the 515-05 law in the removal process? The department's understanding is that 8-515.05 is used in situations when the department is contemplating a removal before that removal happens. And the department was contemplating the removal before the court said anything, correct? No, it was when the court entered the order, the department didn't object to that order. But I believe before the court entered that order, the department was saying, we've already contacted daycare, we've already started to reach out, we've begun the removal process before the court ever said, I'll sign an oral CP, I'll grant an emergency CPC. Isn't that correct? It was before the court said that he would sign the order that was filed. So the department should have followed the 8-515-05, not gone around that. So I'm still struggling with why the department didn't follow it. Your Honor, I respectfully disagree. The department believed that it was following a court-ordered removal. And that removal was based on the parent's motion made in open court. The filing of the physical motion and order... The parents asked for the removal? The parents did, yes. And then, so the parents asked for a removal orally. It wasn't a proper motion because it wasn't filed in writing, which is what's required, correct? Typically, but the position was that it was an emergency removal based on the concerns. So what's the emergency? 
the concerns was the statements made by the foster parents that they were going to possibly subject the child to media scrutiny and also the concern regarding the compliance with court orders especially considering that we were in the middle of a rule 59 hearing and so there was some concern that if the court ordered the child returned to mother's physical custody the foster parents would not comply with that order so miss williams i need to go back to a statement you made earlier where you said that it was your apprehension or belief that uh as a result of the rule 59 proceeding the child was going to be returned to the custody of mother obviously that's uncertain the evidence wasn't concluded yet well and the reason that caught my attention was because at our oral argument concerning the motion to stay i believe you indicated to us that the dcs intended to shortly be filing a motion to change the case plan from reunification to severance and the council for the guardian ad litem said she absolutely opposed returning the child to mother or to the parents so i'm i'm to clarify um the department does oppose reunification of the child with mother physical placement at this point that doesn't mean that that's what the court's going to do um the department and the guardian ad litem adamantly oppose returning the child to the father and there that is not on the table at this point um i did misspeak at our oral argument um on the stay hearing and that was the department was contemplating filing a termination motion regarding father because grounds exist as to father but at this point the department doesn't have grounds to pursue termination of mother's parental rights and so that clarification i appreciate it certainly i and i apologize for misspeaking at that hearing um i had just learned about the case a few hours before um i did want to point out um to correct a couple of things um first of all mr horn repeatedly refers to the foster parents as the parents and clearly they are not the parents of this child no matter how much they may wish to be their rights and their interest in this child are governed by their contract with the state of arizona to provide care and that contract doesn't give them a right to a hearing even under 8515.05 they don't have a right to a hearing in the juvenile court or to relief in this court from that removal order even if the department had pursued this or if we go back and the department pursues this their remedy is through an administrative proceeding through the grievance process at dcs not through a hearing in the juvenile court they would have the right to a hearing on placement if they are permitted to intervene but again that hasn't been heard yet by the juvenile court so their request for return of the child is premature just as their request to intervene is um i would also point out that there were no secret ex parte proceedings here counsel let me stop and uh let me take you back to the issue because i pulled up the transcript from the hearing uh for december 13th and and i think it's important to clarify who initiated the removal of the child that your position is not supported by the transcript by the record um so at some point the judge receives the note there's discussion about counsel uh for mother communicating with mother getting father back on the line there's a bench conference were you present did you i was not physically present no so you didn't participate in that bench conference no there was an assistant attorney general there mr hutchison i was not there okay and so um do you have um do you have notes regarding what transpired at that bench conference my understanding was that that was the discussion that was when the parents uh i believe one of the parents counsel said i want her removed right now right and um well that's part of the record she's insisting i want her removed right now and mr hutchison says after the bench conference so given the circumstances the department is going to facilitate an emergent removal there's concerns that the child will be picked up early from daycare so efforts are underway to one block access to the child to retrieve the child from foster care three if the child's already gone getting the child back in placement also reaching out to licensing worker and all other pertinent individuals in order to coordinate getting the child back and prevent access this does not sound like the court's initiating uh orders to remove the child this sounds like dcs is saying we're getting this child back that was if i may i believe that was after a recess so that was after the department had a chance to go back and uh discuss that with some senior management so that was before the court entered any orders or even was involved the department made the decision to begin that process not the court it was my understanding is it was after the parents had requested removal and the court had indicated that the court was uh unhappy with the statements that had been made 
and then a recess was granted to let everyone discuss it. But never said, I'll remove the child. Never said, those, that statement from the court didn't come until the department said, we've initiated all of these things. Isn't that accurate? I apologize. I don't recall. I would have to look at that portion of the transcript again. But I did want to clarify that none of these proceedings were ex parte. The proceedings all contained all of the parties to this proceeding. The foster parents were not and are not parties and had no right to be present at any of these proceedings. The public has a right to be present. That's correct. And the court didn't actually close the courtroom, did it? No, but the court did exclude the foster parents specifically. Don't they have to have a reason to exclude somebody? And the court did. What was the court's reason to exclude them from the hearing? On page six of the transcript, the court found that he had repeatedly admonished the foster parents regarding confidentiality. And in light of the fact that the parents were again raising the issue that the foster parents continued to relay confidential information, the court excluded them from the proceeding. And this is the very thing that you had just, your client had just filed notice that you disagreed with that, correct? That's correct. But the court obviously overruled our objection or implicitly, I should say, by removing the foster parents from the proceeding. And that was something that was within the court's discretion to do. Again, the only testimony at that hearing was the mother's testimony. And so the mother had a strong interest in not having her personal information relayed to the foster parents, given her concerns regarding their use of that information. And so had this been a situation where perhaps there was going to be a bonding assessment or something like that, there may have been, the department may have been more vociferous in objecting to their removal and may have felt that they needed to hear that information. But since that information was only going to be the mother's testimony regarding her belief that she could properly parent the child, the foster parents didn't need to be there for that. And so I guess I'm struggling with why and how the department suddenly switched from its whole perspective, which was no removal. And the only evidence was a motion that the department had already opposed or the court granted it. That's the only difference. As the department went into this process of, we've already begun the process of removing the child. It was the foster parent statements that were made to court personnel. That's what prompted the change. It was, in a sense, sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. It became clear at that point that the foster parents and the parents were not going to be able to have a working relationship. And that given that we were in the middle of determining this custody hearing, that it was going to be problematic to allow the child to remain with the foster parents if there was that concern that they were not going to obey court orders. As they had demonstrated in the past, the court had ordered specific visitation schedules and they didn't comply with that because they had other plans on a Saturday. But counsel, should there not have been some fact findings? Should there not have been some evidence taken at the time when this email is handed to the judge? Maybe bring in the foster parents, put them under oath and ask them, did you say this? Did you not? Maybe put the staff, the court staff member under oath and ask. Don't you think a different procedure should have been used? In hindsight, yeah, certainly. There probably should have been more fact finding. And there could have been had not the foster parents immediately filed a special action and stayed all the proceedings in the juvenile court. So to the extent that they're complaining about the length of time this is occurring, the court could have already heard and decided their motion to intervene, but they stayed those proceedings. So any delay here is attributable to their actions in filing the special action instead of first seeking relief in the juvenile court. So what do you think should be the outcome now? The outcome now, I believe this court should find that the foster parents have no right to a hearing in the juvenile court or in this court regarding the removal of the child from their care. I believe that the court can order the juvenile court to order that the parties comply with ARS 8515.05 and the department can conduct that hearing. But I believe it should ultimately be up to the juvenile court to determine where the child is placed after that 8515.05 conference and the resulting foster care review board recommendation is made, particularly in light of the pending proceedings. I had a thought and it's gone. I do, I want to clarify that the department is not seeking to vilify these foster parents. They have been caring for this child and doing exactly what we asked of them, which is to love this child as if she were their own. And that is a horrible burden to place on someone to ask them to love a child and then give that child up. 
but that is exactly what the department did and was clear about that from the start that they were not going to keep this child if reunification occurred and so to the extent that they have expressed otherwise again that the department's concerns have continued to rise during these proceedings given the statements made by the foster parents and their counsel regarding their desire to adopt this child at all costs when the department is still albeit somewhat reluctantly pursuing reunification with the parents at least with the mother you said the results should be the referral back to this to the juvenile court have the juvenile court order compliance with 8515 is that 8515 B which is the requirement that the meeting occur that there be two members of the foster care review board I believe correct and then a majority vote carries 815 B specifically says it says a child should not be removed unless a majority of the members participate here the child has already been removed the department would defer to subsection D to those procedures for the because of the fact that the child has already been removed I in light of particularly the the pending hearings the department doesn't favor returning the child to the foster parents only to have the child then removed again to be returned to mother if that's the ultimate outcome of the rule 59 if you find that the 815 B should have been or 815 should have been complied with don't we get them to as close as we can to that which is ordered the 815 B process which is what should have been followed if we find it wasn't appropriate to remove the child I understand what you're saying 815 B applies but if we find that that was an improper removal does how does the department get the benefit of an improper removal by having a less stringent review process why wouldn't it's not a benefit to the department the department has gained no benefit from this child's removal well the department is asking to not have to comply with B as opposed to D they're different processes so let's not call it a benefit why should the department be not be required to comply with B if 815 was 05 was violated well ultimately the juvenile court has authority to review any of the department's decisions so if under 8515.05 B the majority believes that this child should be returned to the foster parents I think ultimately that decision needs to be made by the juvenile court not well it's evidence so that the court would have there was a process we had all of these people in that process resulted in a vote one way or the other right so I would I wouldn't guess so isn't that what the court should have when it makes that decision not I would the D process I would fully support the parties participating in the 8515.05 and the foster parents participating in that proceeding providing the results of that proceeding to the juvenile court and allowing the juvenile court to make the ultimate determination about where the child should that happen um I I don't know for certain but I imagine it could the the requirement is that it be held within 24 hours so I imagine that's something that could be convened fairly quickly and how many days has the child been in the current placement since December 13th so not quite a month or a little over a month six months because the department had been doing that in the meantime is there anything really stopped them from doing that within the 24 hours the department did hold a staffing with the foster parents that didn't include the foster care review board it was a team it was it was a placement stabilization TDM at that point and and did confer with the foster parents but then shortly thereafter the proceedings were stayed in the special action so the department hasn't taken any action other than to ensure the child's well-being very good thank you thank you counsel mr. your honors thank you your honors memory was correct the judge with the judge threatened before the department made its recommendation was to hold the parents in contempt if they did do publicity which is perfectly proper and that's at the top of page 65 of the transcript there was a meeting held after the judge after the proceeding before the judge it was held that Wednesday it should have been a 515.05 meeting the department decided not to hold a 515.05 meeting they just held a team meeting where the foster parents had no rights there was no votes the foster care review board was not there that was a major error by the by the department but our burden is to show that the judge was an error not necessarily the department and the judge's error was in excluding the foster parents and then 
of getting around 515.05 by ordering, after the department asked for it, an immediate removal without any notice or hearing. Let me just ask, is it inappropriate if a judge, if Judge Padilla was looking at this saying, I've had a problem with these people saying they'll go to the media, allegations one way or the other, I'm going to exclude them so we don't have that problem today. Is that an inappropriate? It's an inappropriate order if he doesn't hear from the foster parents first. It's completely, I can't imagine anything more contrary to our system than ex parte orders. It's completely unethical on the part of the judge. It's completely unethical on the part of the parties who participated in it. In our system, we don't do things ex parte. But if the judge says I've had a problem, they haven't followed my orders regarding confidentiality, and so I'm just going to have them leave today. But isn't that, the judge has already had experience and information, is that fair to say? That is a false allegation made by the department. We put in the declaration that every time they were accused of that, and the mother's lawyer is very active in making false accusations, it was disproved that when they said you disclosed something to the doctor, it turns out that it was the department that disclosed something to the doctor. That was in the declaration that your honors have, and it was never controverted. So the evidence is that when counsel gets up and says they had been, there's a history, they've been violating court orders in the past, that's completely false. There had been false accusations of it, and you can see it in the document that they filed shortly before this event when they opposed what the mother's attorney wanted, that they had been completely compliant. Okay, so now if 8515.05 is a procedure that should have been followed, it was not followed, and now the question is what happens going forward if we were to order that that procedure, that statute be complied with, and the hearing would have to be held within 72 hours of foster parents expressing their disagreement with the change of placement, which we anticipate would happen. Why should the child not remain where she is? She's been out of placement in this new placement for 40 days. Why should 24 hours for foster parents to oppose and 72 hours for the meeting to happen? Why should that not happen? Two reasons, your honor. The first reason is, and I've submitted an article on this, the child is suffering from being separated. How do you know that? Because all the studies show that if you take a child from the only caregivers the child has known, there are lasting psychological... So are you saying that no foster child shall ever be returned to their own parents because they've been, after all, in placement with a foster family? No, there's a process for that, and that is the second point I was going to get to, is the removal was completely illegal, and if the child stays where the child is, this court would be sanctioning that kind of illegal conduct. Okay, but can we step aside for a moment from the argument of we don't want DCS to get their way. We don't want DCS to win. They did something wrong. They didn't follow the statute, and now they get to win. Isn't this about the child? And if she is not going to be returned to this foster placement, if that's not going to happen, which is a possibility, why should this kid pack up her things, go back to the foster parents, and then 72 hours later be removed again? Isn't that more damaging? Your Honor, there is nothing in this record that indicates that the child should be removed from the foster parents. So we have no reason to expect that. Well, that's subject to a vote. That's subject to a procedure, which could go one way or another. There are no guarantees. But they ignored the procedure, and the child is suffering. And it's also, we're the only ones that focus on the interest of the child, but it's also about the system, Your Honor. Is this court going to sanction a secret ex parte order and reward them by leaving the child for even more time, which adds to that argument? Before we leave, I have to say one last thing, because you have accused a judicial officer of violating the law and participating in ex parte orders. And strictly speaking, ex parte means without the presence of the parties. And the parties, as the state pointed out, were present. So I would be very careful about continuing to throw that argument around. There was a process, maybe not the process that should have been followed. Maybe the foster parents were not given an opportunity to clarify what they had said and what they had not said to refute the allegations against them. But I would be very careful about continuing to say that ex parte hearings were held in this particular case. Your Honor, if somebody's going to say remove the child from the only caregiver that the child has ever known for 13 months, the foster parents should be there to correct misstatements. 
to present that way the judge makes a good decision because he hears from all sides if you only hear from one side you can't possibly make a good decision all right thank you counsel thank you for your arguments thank you everything that was provided to us we'll take this under advisement we'll issue a written order uh i usually say in due course but we'll try and make it as quickly as we can with that we are adjourned